This video is sponsored by Endel. If you want to increase your focus while working, studying, or just nailing your daily tasks, Endel is a clever app that combines AI technology, science, and a deep knowledge of sound to create personalized soundscapes, specifically to help you relax, focus, and sleep. Endel's patented AI technology, Endel Pacific, adapts your soundscape to real-time inputs like location, weather, and heart rate to improve how you feel, night or day. I use it to help me concentrate on writing operations room scripts. Endel delivers the fastest and most consistent focus compared to listening to streaming platforms. The first 100 people to download Endel via our link will get a free week of audio experiences. Download Endel today via our link to relax, sleep or increase your focus. Israeli aircraft are over Lake Victoria in Ugandan airspace. Amid a tropical storm, the roar of thunder and cracks of lightning nullify the aircraft's hum. Operation Thunderbolt could not be more aptly named. They relay the message over Jordan. The aircraft, Israeli C-130 Hercules or Karnafs, approach the airport at the town of Entebbe. As Karnaf 1 nears the runway, it is consumed by darkness until at the very last moment the runway's lights become discernible and the aircraft touches down. Rolling down the runway, 26 men of the Sayarat Zan Hamin prepare to disembark to place lights along the runway for the remaining aircraft. 27th of June 1976, Singapore Airlines Flight 736 lands at Athens Airport after a stopover in Bahrain, where two members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine Special Operations Group, Fayez Abdul Rahim Jaber and Jael Naji Al Arjam, board the aircraft. With them are two West Germans. Wilfried Bose and Bridget Kuhlmann of the Revolutionnaire Zelen. Also landing at Athens comes Air France Flight 139, bound for Paris via Athens from Tel Aviv. At 11.30am, Flight 139 lands, where the four members board the aircraft. As Flight 139 departs with its 260 passengers and crew, the aircraft is immediately seized, with Bose bursting onto the flight deck wielding a pistol and a grenade. The aircraft is ordered towards Libya, while monitoring units in Israel become aware of the evolving situation. Flight 139 is granted permission by Libyan officials to land at Benghazi airport, where negotiations between the hijackers and the Libyan government conclude with a transfer of fuel, allowing them to continue their route. One hostage, Patricia Martel, feigns a miscarriage and is removed from the aircraft. With the aircraft readied, it departs for the heart of Africa, at this time, the Israeli government remains unaware of the hijackers' motives, whilst Patricia Martel, now back in Britain, is interviewed by Scotland Yard. Representatives from the Israeli embassy confirm the presence of four hijackers. All the while, Flight 139 has flown deep into the heart of Africa. During the early morning hours of the 28th of June, it lands at Entebbe International Airport. Here, the hijackers are joined by Fawad Awad, Abdel Al Latif, and Abu Ali. As the aircraft touches down, it is surrounded by Ugandan soldiers. The Ugandan government is supportive of the hijackers, and after nine hours of negotiations, Flight 139 is moved to the old terminal where the hostages are disembarked and confined. Courtesy of the British Broadcasting Corporation, the Israeli government learns that Flight 139 has landed at Entebbe. With this, Colonel Ehud Barak establishes an ad hoc group to deliberate potential military operations. During such deliberations, Major General Benny Paled suggests transporting 1,000 troops over 2,000 miles to Entebbe. On the 29th of June, the hijackers finally release a communique listing their demands, including the release of 53 pro-Palestinian militants across five countries by 2pm on the 1st of July. Here, Israel faces a problem, as bowing to the hijackers' demands would likely set a lasting precedent. Meanwhile, an operative of the Israeli intelligence agency Mossad flies over Entebbe in a light aircraft to collect photographs of the airfield. In a meeting with Israeli Minister of Defense Shimon Peres, Benny Paled demands, What do you want, that we conquer Entebbe or the whole country? Peres replies, How many do you need for that? To which Peled replies, to conquer the whole country I need 1,000 soldiers, to conquer Entebbe maybe 200 men. For the hostages at Entebbe, their stay is becoming perilous. During the afternoon, 
Jews and Israeli nationals were separated from those of other nationalities. One hostage, a Holocaust survivor, recalls, I felt myself back 32 years when I heard German orders waving guns. I imagined shuffling lines and harsh cries of Jews to the right. On the 30th of June, some 47 hostages, mainly French nationals, are released and flown to Paris as a goodwill gesture from Ugandan President Idi Amin. From these, Israeli intelligence officers gather information helping them to build a picture of the hijackers' numbers, equipment and routines. Moreover, they confirm that none expect a military response and are accordingly lax. On the 1st of July, the remaining 101 non-Jews are released leaving only 94 Israelis and 12 defiant aircrew. As the deadline fast approaches, Israel negotiates an extension until the 4th of July. Come the 3rd of July, the day of the Sabbath, with meetings taking place in Tel Aviv, a force of four Hercules, named by the Israelis as the Karnaf, depart from Lod Airport heading in different directions to avoid arousing the suspicion of inquisitive eyes below. In complete radio silence, the aircraft land at Ophira, as a civilian airliner above almost dashes the operation secrecy by broadcasting of a party beneath. Here, the Karnafs prepare themselves for the 2,484 mile journey to Entebbe. The aircraft are given permission to depart. As they do, they briefly cross into Saudi airspace before heading southwards towards the gauntlet of the Red Sea. As the formation transits across, Saudi radar operators below keep a watchful eye on traffic. Back in Tel Aviv, two Boeing 707s depart from Lod Airport, heading for Kenyan airspace as political deliberations conclude with unwavering support for a strike. Once clear of Egyptian and Saudi radar installations, and before entering the ranges of French and Soviet radars in Eritrea and Somalia, all four aircraft filled to the brim with Israeli special forces turn southwest towards Uganda. With Karnaf-1 on the ground at Entebbe Airport, Lieutenant Colonel Sharni turns his aircraft towards the old terminal, and with his ramp lowered, a Mercedes-Benz and two Land Rovers manned by 29 men of the Sayeret Matkul, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Yoni Netanyahu, move in procession towards the old terminal. As they approach, two Ugandan soldiers halt their advance. As one raises his rifle, the other disappears into the darkness. Yoni commands his Mercedes to cut right, enabling a clear line of fire. The first Ugandan soldier is struck, falling to the ground, only to stagger to his feet. As he does so, the stillness of the night is shattered by the crack of Kalashnikov fire from the Land Rover behind, killing the soldier. The second Ugandan soldier reappears but is promptly shot down by the mounted machine gun. All secrecy is now lost in the fusillade of gunfire. Immediately, Yoni Netanyahu orders the procession to make haste towards the old terminal, as Ugandan guards from the control tower open fire. With the vehicles now reaching the old terminal, the 29 men of the Sayeret Mat Call disembark, racing towards their entry points. At the forefront, Muki Betsa fires at a fleeting Ugandan soldier who retreats into the terminal. Approaching the old terminal, Betsa spots one of the hijackers, Wilfred Bowes, step outside the building. Taking aim, Betsa fires and misses. Bose bursts back into the departure hall, shouting, The Ugandans have gone crazy, they're shooting at us. The Sire at Matkul briefly falter as they bunch up beneath the old air traffic control tower. Spurred on by the yells of Yoni Netanyahu, the teams continue to their entry points. As Betsa reaches the first entrance point, he finds it blocked with no way through. Sprinting past him, Sergeant Amir Ofer reaches the second doorway and spots a militant ahead. Ofer fires a burst into the building as the militant returns fire. Within seconds, the militant is dead. Outside, Yoni Netanyahu steps away from the building, observing his forces' progression. As he does so, a lone Ugandan soldier in a concealed position fires wildly towards the Israeli soldiers. Yoni is struck, collapsing to the ground with wounds to his chest and arms. Several Israelis return fire, neutralising the Ugandan soldier. Spurred on by this, Ofer bursts into the big hall where the hostages are contained. As he enters, he turns right. To his rear, Bose and Kuhlman are crouched on the ground. As they turn to fire on Ofer, his team lead, Amnon Paled, bursts through the door and kills them both. Mindful of his orders not to falter for the fallen, Netanyahu's men press on. 
Amon Goren and Muki Betza now burst into the main hall, as a second militant emerges from behind a concrete column raising his Kalashnikov. Returning fire, Goren strikes the militant's weapon rendering it useless. In the crossfire, hostages Ida Borochevich and Pasco Cohen are fatally wounded. Despite being ordered to stay prone, in a panic, hostage John Jack Maimoni rises to his feet and is shot dead by an Israeli operator before the man can be identified. Rushing to his aid, Yitzhak David is also shot dead as orders to remain prone are barked. All four militants guarding the hostages have now been neutralised, with the firefight lasting just 50 seconds. Israeli operators now head towards the militants' living quarters and a small hall at the end of the building. The remainder of Bester, Peled, Zussman and Amos Ben Avraham's teams push into the main hall via the second entrance. Reaching the entrance to the small hall, Lieutenant Giora Zussman enters, spraying the room with rounds. As he retires to the entrance, two members of his team race past, firing into the kitchen area at the end of the hallway. Here they find two dead Ugandan soldiers. Men of Danny Arditi's team attempt to breach the militants' living quarters. Unable to enter, one operator throws a grenade which fails to go through a window, bouncing back, wounding one of Arditi's men. Zussman and Reisman now venture further into the building, covering their rear is Tamir Prado. As they advance, they encounter two figures dressed in civilian clothing. Zussman passes by, but Reisman halts, noticing their military webbing loaded with grenades. Reisman shoots them dead. As they fall to the ground, a grenade rolls out, but the blast is blocked by the corpses. Arditi's team is able to break in through a narrow window and mop up the militants' quarters, assisted by men of Ben Avraham's team. In total, seven of the ten militants have been killed. At the other end of the terminal building, Captain Riker clears the customs hall and moves up the stairs to the second floor. Two Ugandans are shot dead trying to descend the staircase. Captain Yiftar and Rani Cohen rush into the final room at the top of the staircase, the Ugandan soldiers' living quarters. As they breach, they find the room littered with abandoned blankets. The rest of the Ugandans have simply fled. With the last room cleared, the two climb to the roof, where they spot the firefight taking place between Arnon Epstein's support team and Ugandan soldiers up in the control tower. While the storming of the old terminal has been taking place, Another assault team has rushed to storm the new terminal building, its control tower, and airport facilities, all of which have been captured quickly and secured. Precisely on schedule, Carnaf 2 lands and begins to taxi along the runway. Two armed jeeps disembark, with two more special forces teams heading towards the old terminal. As they drive to join their comrades, the runway plunges into darkness as the runway lights are switched off. Despite this, Carnaf 3 lands, with its complement of two further jeeps, and 30 more Special Forces operators are disembarked. Shortly after, Carnaf 4 lands, with two Peugeot 404 pickups, a 10-man Israeli Air Force crew, a 10-man medical crew, and 20 further operators. Major Shaul Mofaz brings the machine guns on his armed jeep to bear on the control tower, while the jeep moves to take up position covering the military runway and its fighter aircraft. A further two jeeps cover the approach roads from Kampala. With the old terminal's control tower temporarily subdued, Karnaf 4, with its 16-man contingent of operators, is brought forward. While still exchanging fire with Ugandan soldiers in the tower, the process of loading the hostages on board begins. The jeep covering the military runway identifies five MiG-21s and three MiG-17s. The men in the vehicle open fire on the aircraft with machine guns. All are rendered inoperable, with several set alight. With fresh Ugandan troops observed approaching from the north, the entire force rushes to re-embark on the Karnafs. With all of the hostages accounted for, Karnaf 4 rolls down the taxiway towards the main runway to take off. The jeeps fight a holding action against the remaining Ugandan forces, while the operators refuel and then load onto the other aircraft. As the last Israeli soldiers board, smoke grenades are thrown nearby to shroud the vulnerable aircraft during its last undefended moments. Finally, with the entire raiding force loaded, the remaining aircraft taxi towards the runway, where they will safely take off into the darkness. The raid on Entebbe would become immortalised in Israel, with 102 of 106 hostages rescued and 7 hijackers eliminated, the operation is a resounding success. 
Yoni Netanyahu would himself become a national hero, alongside the five others wounded during the raid. The sheer audacity to fly special forces halfway across the world, land at the airport, perform the raid, refuel, and then take back off to fly home again, would grant the Entebbe raid status as one of the most daring and frankly outrageous special forces raids ever conducted. On our sister channel The Intel Reports this week, we're looking at why the hijackers took the aircraft to, of all places, Uganda, and why they were welcomed there. 